to focus on lesson planning. So let's get started. You'll see at your uh, tables a um, rubric cube, and for that's for those of you who need to have something to do while you're entertaining different thoughts or working on uh, processing information. So see if you can solve the problem by getting uh, the words to align with the steps to lesson planning, which are written over there on that sheet, that charge chart sheet, okay? Um, these are the six steps of UDL lesson planning that um, I write about in, in my book, uh, and we'll be talking about it, each one in, in depth. What I need to know right now is how many of you actually know a little bit about universal design for learning and how many of you uh, might be experts at UDL because that will help me to make sure I answer your questions. So on a scale of one to five, <laughs> uh, just raise your hand if you're sort of at a one where this, you know, you heard about UDL but you really don't have any idea what it is and you came here to figure out the nuts and bolts. A five if indeed, uh, so yeah, so you're going to put a one up, okay? A five if you already are using UDL and you're actually a UDL coach or um, a UDL specialist, an instructional specialist who assigns UDL um, strategies to teachers. So if you're at that end or if you teach about UDL at workshops, then a five and anywhere in between. So one to five, where might you be? Okay, great, all right, <laughs> and we've even got a, a zero, all right, well that's good. Most of you are in that one to two, couple, I saw a couple threes, but for the most part we're, we're all at the same um, level, so that'll be helpful as we go through the beginning part of this session today. Um, these are the six steps of UDL lesson planning, you'll hear those six steps in depth throughout the session, uh, and ultimately I would like you by the end of this session to be able to feel that you can use one of those steps in your lesson planning. But you choose, you choose what might work for you. In fact, I'd like you to think right now about a personal goal that you might want to develop for yourself something that you want to be able to know or be able to do by the time you leave here in 90 minutes. So think about that for a moment. There's paper at the table if you want to write it down. The, you all have handouts so you'll be able to write it on the handout if you'd like to. These are just some examples of what you might think about being able to do by the end of the session. Um, they're my examples. They may not fit what you want. So take a moment and think about what your personal goal might be, and then I'm going to ask you to share it with a colleague at the table. Okay, sounds like most of you have shared your personal goal in some way. So let's start with the big question. What is universal design for learning? All of you should have gotten a universal design for learning bingo card when you came in. You'll note that on the other side is an exit ticket. When we leave at the end, if um, you look like you, you missed out, you need one with an exit ticket. Anybody else that's missing an exit ticket, let me know. At the end of the session, I'm gonna ask you to hand in your exit tickets like you would if you were using that. Just take the top one if you would. Um, and uh, we're going to pull one out of my little glass bowl and whoever gets that ticket pulled will win a copy of my book. Um, so you're going to have lots of books to take home from here and that's going to be one of them for the lucky winner. For the rest of you, we're going to play bingo. I want you to listen very carefully for the words that are on your bingo card. And as you hear them addressed, 
either in the video that I'm going to show you or in my after video explanation, cross it off. And the first person who fills up their entire card will be the winner. And we should have quite a few winners actually. All right, and we have some prizes for you. All right, we ready? This is a, um, so there's a set of videos that go with the book that I wrote. It's called Your UDL Lesson Planner, Step-by-Step -step Guide to Teaching All Learners. It's available from Brooks Publishing. And um, with the video, uh, with the book come six free videos that you can use for you know, your own edification or if you want to use it with a staff or something like that where you can actually show uh, if you've got a personal, uh, professional learning community that you're working with and you want to um, hone in on a piece of the lesson planning process, you can uh, access those videos and use them as a talking point. So, universal design for learning is based on uh, how our brains work. And basically, in your brain, if everybody's brain, there are three sets of neural networks. And these three sets of neural networks are activated when we're learning anything. Any human being has these three sets of networks. One network has to do with, and it's in the center of your brain, this green area here, it really has to do with your affective networks, how you emotionally uh, deal or address learning. And it's deep down inside the brain. So the f one of the major principles of UDL is to use multiple means of engagement in order to engage those affective networks of your learners. Another principle has to do with the networks that are located towards the back of our brains, and those are the recognition networks. And the recognition networks really are about how you perceive uh, and understand and assign meaning to your environment. And the principle of UDL that is associated with the recognition networks is the uh, re uh, principle of um, representation to provide multiple means of representation. The third principle, or uh, the another principle, because they're not actually one, two, and three, they, they are all equally important, uh, has to do with the front part of our brains and the neural networks that help us to strategically plan and demonstrate what we know. So in order to activate the strategic networks, the UDL principle is to provide multiple means of action and expression. Okay. You have a copy of the UDL guidelines in front of you. As you look at the UDL guidelines, you see that they're organized in a certain way to deal with each one of those sets of networks. Now, I said earlier that not one network is more important than the other, not one principle is more important than the other. They're all important. However, if you're not engaged, you're not learning. And you, as the teacher, you can be standing on your head and students aren't engaged, well, they're not learning. So in many ways, engagement is the first principle, the most important principle from my perspective to look at in terms of um, designing your learning environment and designing your lessons. And a lot of other people who teach about UDL feel the same way. Now, the other way that UDL uh, guidelines are, uh, how you doing on your bingo cards? Good? Okay. Um, another way that the UDL guidelines are uh, structured is vertically. In that across the row, or horizontally if you want to put it that way, across this row, all of the guidelines that are in this row have to do with how we access information. You, CAST actually just came out with this explanation, uh, although a number of us have been talking about it for years. Um, 
the, the items that are along the middle row really have to do with how you build skills, knowledge, understanding. So you first have to be able to access recruiting your, the students' interests, making sure that they can perceive the information, uh, and making sure that they have options for physical action, that they can get to it. Then moving and building on that, once they have the information, being able to sustain that interest, sustain their attention, and persist through distractions like we just did here with the video coming on and whatnot. You guys stayed with me, thank you. Um, also building understanding for language, language comprehension, um, different kinds of symbols, mathematical language and expressions, and being able to use what you know to demonstrate what you know. So being able to have options for expression and communication. And then finally, that top level, sorry, let's go back. The top level is really about internalizing. Internalizing these skills and sets of knowledge in a way that you can generalize the information, you can use it in multiple situations, you can use it and um, strategically use it for your own growth. You can set, um, regulate your own learning. You know what you want to learn, and you know how to learn. You can um, build deep understanding and comprehension, and transfer information from one content to the other, and then also that you can use what are called your executive functions which are located towards the front of the brain, and they have to do with how you strategically set goals for yourself, monitor your learning, and um, become a resourceful learner. The whole goal of UDL is to, be, is to help all students, no matter what their underlying skill sets or readiness levels are, or how they learn, for all learners to become expert learners. Not necessarily kids who all get A's, but expert learners. They know how they learn, they know what they want to learn, and they learn effectively. They're resourceful in their learning. All right. How are we doing with the bingo? Anybody have full bingo yet? No. Okay. So, a couple of points that I just want to bring out again to make sure that you crossed out everything on your bingo sheets. UDL is based on research. There are, uh, it's based on how the brain works. There are networks, neural networks or pathways in the brain, uh, three sets of them, and that the three principles of UDL are designed in such a way that you can meet the needs of all your learners through your lesson planning process. Well, very briefly, in terms of lesson planning, I want you to meet Molly, Bre uh, Brenda, and Darrell. They are three teachers that have specific concerns about lesson planning. They're going to use the UDL lesson planning process, these six steps, which can seem kind of overwhelming, but it's really, it's all about pulling out nuggets that work for you and infusing them into what you're already using. Nobody's asking you to try from scratch to do something totally different. Um, sure that you can see ways that uh, this will apply to what you're already doing and how you can enhance one step or another uh, in your own lesson planning process. So we'll start first with goals. Designing goals. And this is Molly. Molly has some questions about UDL and her lesson planning process. She knows that if her goals are real quality goals, effective goals, that her learners can articulate those goals themselves. She also knows that 
the goals will be flexible enough to provide different options, different choices to different students who might have different interests or different skill sets. And she also knows that no matter what she's doing in her lesson, she needs to know at the end of the lesson if they've learned it. So that means that her goal has to be explicit so that she can actually measure it. You start when you're designing your goals, you know, with a standard. Do you have standards here in Indiana? Do you still use, do you use Common Core? Yes, no, some do, some don't. Okay. So you have your own Indiana state standards. That's where you start with designing your goals. Standards are not goals, right? Standards are a basis for goals. They give you a purpose for your goal. Then you focus on what you want your students to be able to do, what you want them to be able to show you, um, what you want them to be able to know uh, by the end of your lesson. And that's really what, how you define where to start with your goal. Now, how many of you know about SMART goals? Many of you, special ed educators in particular, have been inundated with the concept of SMART goals. Okay, so we're gonna talk very briefly about SMART goals in a minute, but for the time being, I want you to take a look at these vocabulary. And at your tables, have a discussion about whether you think some of those vocabulary words, verbs, might be constricting in nature, in that they define and limit what the students might be able to do to show you that they've learned whatever it is that they're trying to teach them. All right, so at your tables, look at those verbs and see if you can figure out which ones are the constrictive verbs, the ones that really limit what students might be able to show you or be able to do in the lesson. And while you, you have them all in front of you while you do, my friend is going to help me bring them up. All right. So my premise is, when you're writing your goals, if you want to make your goals as inclusive as possible, try to avoid using restrictive verbs. Why write a goal that says you must multiply you know, the students will multiply to design the final answers for this, for these 10 word problems. Why write it that way when you can write it? You can solve these 10 word problems and demonstrate your knowledge by. Then you provide choice from the get-go and flexibility from the get-go when you're writing your goals. Your UDL Lesson Planner, the step-by-step -step guide for teaching all learners by Dr. Patty Valibate, will guide you in your UDL lesson planning. How do you plan your lessons to meet the needs of all your learners? Let's look at how the six steps of the UDL lesson planning process can work for you. This video is a brief window into steps you can take to create learning experiences that engage learners, activate thinking, and scaffold deep understanding using Universal Design for Learning, UDL. What do they both have? Someone raise their hand and show. Meet Maria, yeah. a middle school teacher who uses UDL as a lesson planning process to enhance her teaching. She knows that UDL is a lens for examining curriculum and designing instruction. Originated by CAST, UDL is a framework based on neuroscience organized around three broad principles that align with three brain networks. Let's unpack this definition a bit. The UDL principle of engagement corresponds to the affective networks, the parts of the brain that engage students in learning. The UDL principle of representation corresponds to the recognition networks, the parts of the brain that understand vocabulary, concepts, and new information and the UDL principle of action and expression correspond to the strategic networks, the parts of the brain that students use to plan their own learning, to show what they've learned, and to express themselves. So what are the six steps of the UDL lesson planning process? First, start with defining a clear, flexible, 
smart learning goal based on an appropriate standard. Today, I can tell what the important Second, parts of Use the UDL guidelines to consider what learner variability may be present in the lesson and what scaffolds may be needed. Third, determine assessments for the lesson. Classroom measures that provide meaningful data about how well the students met the learning goal. Fourth, choose instructional methods, materials, and media that best support student learning. Next, the fifth step. Teach the lesson, making sure to gather information about student learning. Finally, the sixth step is critically important. Reflect on your lesson. Evaluate its effectiveness to determine how to make your instruction even more successful. So as you were doing that, you were looking for um, constrictive goals, or, uh, verbs, and you did find write and read. I also think state. Now, my background, I'm a former speech and language pathologist. So I wrote lots of go goals saying student will state, student will say, student will produce. And um, thinking back now, I would write those goals differently, frankly, uh, trying to make them more flexible and more supportive in nature. Uh, the math, we talked about the fact that uh, anyone that actually applies a certain procedure that you have to use, uh, mathematical procedure, would be more restrictive in nature. Some of these other verbs, like solving, like comparing, or predict, formulating, analyzing, those are much more flexible kinds of verbs that you can use. And then you have multiple ways that the students can show you that they've actually learned what it is that you're trying to teach them. So that's the first point about goals. Consider using a flexible verb if you can. Now, sometimes you're working on reading, right? That's what you're working on. So you want them to read. You, that's the verb you use. Or you're working on writing. But why conflate it? If you're not working on writing, why make them you know, be assessed and meet the goal if indeed what you want them to know is the rationale for the Civil War? Why say they're going to write an analysis of the Civil War? Why can't they just present or offer uh, or um, compare the difference between what the folks in the South thought and the folks in the North thought, using more flexible verbs as you're writing your goals so that you can come up with a lot of ways that the students can show you that they've learned it. The other element which you said you're already familiar with, now you may have different words that fit these specific word uh, uh, acronyms, but the idea of writing a SMART goal. This comes from business originally, and uh, we've adopted it in education, and I think it makes good sense. Make the goals as specific as possible. Make sure they're measurable. Put lots of stars around that one. It's so, so important. I was having a conversation this morning with a couple of the other presenters, and they were saying basically people are still writing goals saying the students will learn, and they have no measurement. How do you know they learned it? How do you know they learned it? if you don't include a measurement in your goal. Um, make the goals attainable. Some people write achieve achievable for that. Results oriented, meaning that it's focused on what the students are doing, not what you're doing. What are the results of this lesson that you're going to be looking at? Not the teacher will do such and such. That's not a student goal. That's not a lesson goal. That's, uh, that's a professional development goal. <laughs> and, uh, and then time bound. In, in that you want them to learn this information, show you that they know this information within a certain period of time. At the, by the end of the unit, by the end of the class, by the end of the, curric the semester, whatever it is, so that you have in mind when you're going to be measuring this particular goal, and your students do too. So let's take these goals. I want you to pick one of the goals on the right-hand side, and with the folks at your table, see if you can make them smarter. All right? Doesn't have to be fancy, dancy, just something that would be 
a little smarter than what's up there right now. It's a goal that uses read, write, and understand. Okay, take a couple minutes to work on that together as a group. Let's, I came up with some ideas. Um, now, these are very specific, and you wouldn't write specific goals like this for every single lesson, frankly. These are examples. But you might be thinking this, you know, that'll help you to make your goals more uh, flexible, more measurable, more specific in nature. Um, so in the, by changing the, w the word read in this first goal to identify, there are lots of ways that kids that can identify. Kids with severe disabilities can point. They can use their augmentative device to identify at least 10 vocabulary words, well then that gives you a number, you know, so that you can measure that, whether they get eight right or they get four right, that gives you a measurement. Um, using contextual sentence cues, that provides the support, the scaffold that you might need, not all, all the students will need that scaffold, but for those students who do, it's offered as a choice. One of the major points that I want to make uh, uh, is that we have a tendency to lower expectations when kids are struggling. It's a very common thing for us to do, and many of us have actually been taught to do that. But my premise is, instead of lowering expectations, heighten the support that you give them. Provide more scaffolds. Think about what else they need in order to be successful so that everyone can meet high expectations in your classroom. Uh, the, the other goals here, you know, we changed right to describe because this is not a writing goal. But by using the word right, we end up making it a writing goal. If we're really interested in them being able to describe main characters, well then use that verb as your goal, verb, okay? Um, and those kids who have struggle with writing will have less struggles meeting this goal than they would this one, all right? And then finally, understand, who knows? How do you measure understanding? You know, you have to have all kinds of, by doing such and such and so and so. Well, make sure that what you really want them to do is something that you can measure apply these proportional relationships or solve these problems, something that you can actually measure. Okay, questions on any of that? Okay, you have a choice when you're writing your goals, just as I mentioned before. Choose a flexible verb and if you can't, if you really are working on something that's just very finite and constrictive to begin with, you're working on reading, you're working on writing, uh, then make sure you add the scaffolds that will help students who might struggle to meet that goal uh, to be able to meet the goal. Okay. So that's the first section of the UDL lesson planning process really focusing on goals. The second process uh, uh, piece is thinking about variability. Now UDL is all about variability, learner variability. What you have in front of you, the UDL guidelines, that really, and I steal this a second? Here, all of you should have a copy. Um, based on neuroscience, this is a uh, diagram of the kind of learner variability that will exist in every group. It exists here in this room. And by becoming familiar with the UDL guidelines, you can address almost any learning issues, thinking ahead of time, proactively, about what kind of learner variability is going to exist in the group. You don't even need to know the group. I don't know any of you. 
but I considered when I was designing this that I would have trouble with the technology. So I didn't just depend on, <laughs> on the video. Um, but also that you will have various skills, various mindsets as you come in here, various interests, um, various understandings about UDL, and that I would have to be able to adjust what we were doing. And I looked through the UDL guidelines as I was designing this session, as I do any session. This is what you can do proactively, designing your lessons with an eye towards learner variability. You have these words in your handout. And uh, over the next couple of pieces, I'm going to be talking about which words on the left match words on the right. See if you can figure out which ones they are, OK? This is Brenda. Brenda knows that learning is about experiences. Even if you're reading, you're experiencing something. You're experiencing reading about um, the World War II, or you're reading about a character in the book. You're reading about um, how to use some mathematical procedures <coughs> or a science project. You're reading, and that is an experience. But there are other kinds of experiences that actually work better for many of our students. So when you're thinking about writing your lessons, think about offering them experiences. Because it is within the context of an experience that we actually engage those neural networks and we actually learn. The other thing to keep in mind is that every brain is distinctly different. Even twins that go through the same experience will learn something different and their neural networks will develop in different ways, which is how they, they call back on those neural networks in different experiences to try to transfer and generalize information and knowledge that they have. And they're going to do that differently. Um, no two people ever have the same setups in their brain. Uh, the other piece about variability, though, is that I mean, it sounds like it's just impossible to think about every single student being different. I mean, does that mean you have to design a different lesson for every single kid in the class and do all this individualization? No, you don't. Because learning variability, variability is also systematic and predictable in that it exists within this construct. You know that some learners are going to have some difficulty with self-regulation. You already know that. You don't even have to know which ones. You know that some learners are going to have trouble with planning. Their executive function skills are just not as strong as others. And so you might as well plan for it. As I'm doing this lesson, which pieces of this lesson are going to require the students to engage their executive function skills, their strategic planning, and how can I plan for that and provide supports and scaffolds within the lesson before I even offer the lesson to the students. So that's the piece of lesson planning, UDL lesson planning, where you actually, you're thinking about learning, learner variability the whole time, but this is the piece after you've written the goal, you think, okay, this is what I want them to do, this is how I'm going to measure it, where are the barriers? Who's going to have difficulty? How are they going to have difficulty with this? How can I prepare ahead of time to make sure that I can get them all there and I can measure all of them? The questions that Brenda asks are where those barriers exist, what those barriers are, and where they exist. How will I engage all the learners to make sure they're with me the whole time and that I'll be able to sustain their learning the whole time, their attention the whole time? How will the learners? be able to perceive and understand the information. You have some English learners in the classroom. Well, am I going to make sure that the vocabulary is understandable to them? Or am I going to have to stop and go over and talk to them individually? Why don't I prepare ahead of time so that I have the supports within the lesson, within the learning environment, so those students can actually learn how to help themselves learn the vocabulary? Um, and finally, 
how am I going to allow some flexibility and choice in how the students express their learning? In that way, you're actually engaging their interests. And you can keep those students with you who ordinarily are bored after the first five minutes and they're done. By giving them a personal choice, connecting it to what's important for them. OK. So how did you do? Did you find the, the words that went together? Learning is truly interaction. It develops from interaction. The br every brain is distinct. And variability is predictable. So we're back to the UDL guidelines now. I also wanted to talk a little bit about this. This is, this is from uh, some folks out there, Mar Marsano, different people who really have studied and researched how we teach and lesson development. And that this is really fr taken from a lot of their work. They tell you that neurologically, in the process of one lesson, you should try to address all of these pieces. Okay? In the beginning, you need to get their attention. We have those when we design our lesson planning formats, right? You have a provocative question, or you have an attention getter, or whatever it is, right? Then you've got to make sure that they can access it. That they can see it, they can hear it, they can act on it. Um, if you've got kids with certain motor issues, you have to address that ahead of time. If you've got kids who actually have visual perceptual difficulties, think about addressing that ahead of time with scaffolds or by having multiple ways that you're showing the information. The fact that some of you are probably like me, I learn better from a video or a movie than I do from reading something. And that's why I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to see the video as well as have all these resources and material available to you because some of us just learn better that way. Um, and make it relevant. That means make it personally relevant. Figuring out if you did this one thing for every one of your lessons from this point forward, you would make a significant difference in the number of students who actually achieve your goals. Make it personal. Have them design a personal goal, like you did at the beginning, so that they really are focused in and remind them what that personal goal is. So they're focused in on what it is that they want to learn in that lesson. Make it meaningful. That means really make sure that the language you're using is understandable, uh, that, you've got, that you've put some supports in place, whether it's word walls or it's bilingual dictionaries or Whatever it is that you need to do in order to provide the variability, provide for the variability in what people know, what meaning they might ha bring to the lesson, and then connect it. Connect it to something important. Connect it to their past experiences. Activate their background knowledge. We always hear about that. Well, that's really what it's about. Making it meaningful, connecting it, and before they leave, let them apply it. Give them some time to apply whatever it is. If you wait till next week when you see them, or two days from now when you see them, they will have forgotten it, and you will have to reteach at the beginning of your lesson. So let them apply it in even a short amount of time, a few minutes. Research shows, and I think this is interesting, they did some research on uh, students who were college students and high school students. And they gave them, after chunking certain parts of the lesson, after each one of those chunks, they gave the students a minute or less to reflect on it, to write something down, to talk to a, a colleague, whatever. And in those lessons, the students per retained 40% above 40% more of the content than in lessons where they did, or classes where they didn't do that. Just the fact that you give them time to process the information and connect it to something they already know before you move on to the next piece. Um, or I want you to take a moment right now and tell your, co your friend, your elbow partner, the most important word you heard 
well, after we watched that video or we read that paragraph or whatever it was, so that they have to process it, pull it together, and connect it to something else. Synthesize it, basically. So what you've heard, and this is what we're going to do right now, okay? We're going to give you a chance to reflect on what we've talked about so far, okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What you've heard so far, is this doable? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? Pop, mostly thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay. It's not that hard. And it's not like you're asking somebody to actually totally redesign how they're designing their lessons. It's about UDL being a lens on how you approach your lesson development. Assessment is a really critical topic, and unfortunately, most uh, many, many classroom teachers do not know enough about assessment in order to use it effectively in the classroom. Uh, yeah, and, and I think that that's really um, for that reason, because I teach at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and I teach uh, teacher candidates and active teachers who are in a graduate program to uh, learn how to, well, they're going to get a certificate in bilingual special education, basically, a degree in that. All right. And, more often than not, assessment is something they really don't know very much about. They know about standardized tests, but the kinds of assessments that they can do in the classroom, they don't know very much about. So I want you to think about when you're designing your lessons, okay, this is the goal. I've addressed the learner variability. How am I going to know they learned it? Answering that question, matching the goals to meaningful, flexible assessments, because maybe not everybody will do the same thing, and you still can figure out whether or not they learned it. Think about measuring both the product and the process. For some kids, the process is more important for you to be able to tell if they figured out the process. And for some subjects, science in particular, you know, mathematics, you really want to know if they understand the process. And then also making sure that your assessments are not biased, that they're accessible, um, that they're um, reliable and valid. Those are both uh, technical terms, uh, in particular having to do with bias, we really need to look at our own personal biases. A lot of times we don't even realize that we're assuming the kids have been to a museum. I want you to write about how Tom Sawyer would feel if he was walking through a museum focused on the river. Some kids have never been to a museum. They have no idea what you're asking them to do. And that is actually a biased assessment because of that. So thinking about whether or not you've incorporated bias in your assessment process. Uh, you're pretty familiar with the difference between assessment of learning and assessment for learning. All right, I won't spend a lot of time on this then. Let's, uh, there are different kinds of formative assessments that you can use with students, such as uh, portfolios and surveys and different kinds of reading probes, worksheets, the KWL that we typically do. What do you know? What do you want to know? What have you learned? Um, and also summative types of assessments. But not all summative assessments have to be standardized. You can come up with summative assessments, and you probably do, um, that are actually flexible in nature. And the way to do that is to approach them with rubrics to develop the skill of, of designing rubrics for your products instead of it just being teacher. Oh, this is an A. Oh, this is a B. I, use, I, I give no tests at George Washington University. The t students love that. <laughs> but I use all rubrics. And I have never, since I started using rubrics, I have never had a student come to me and com complain about their grade. The rubric puts out the uh, the understandings of what it is that I expect and how many points they're going to get for what. Um, I also provide them with models and examples, and they know exactly what it is they have to do. And they get it into me on time. It's amazing. Um, this is an example of a rubric. Um, there's a site there at the bottom. You may want to take a look at that. You probably have that on your a uh, sheet that's a Rubistar is a great place you can just go there and they'll make the, uh, tell them what it is you want the students to show you and they'll make up rubrics for you. You can adapt them, it's really, it's great. Uh, and there are a bunch of different ones that are on the, uh, the web now. 
methods, materials, and media, the next step. Daryl's questions have to do with how do I activate background knowledge for this lesson, what methods do I use, how am I going to offer meaningful student choice, and how will the learners monitor their own learning. And really, it all, it's all about what I've been saying from the very beginning, offering relevant choices and flexibility, thinking about the fact that not all students have to do the same thing, and that you can actually use methods that will address and pull in scaffolds that will address the, the learner variability that exists within the room. Balancing assistance with challenge. These are the top 10 teaching methods, according to the experts, that exist in all of our classrooms and schools across the country. Um, in my book, I go into how to apply UDL, infuse UDL principles and guidelines into each one of them. But we're just gonna pick the, the, the top two here. Uh, and I want you to, eat at your tables, just pick one or the other and think about one way that you might address, if you're doing direct instruction, a lecture, like we're doing today, how you might address learner variability using that method uh, or the other, the um, uh, discussion. If you were having a big group discussion, how you might address learner variability using that method. And we'll just take about two minutes to do that at your tables, okay? Okay, what, um, did most of the people choose um, direct instruction? Well, anybody choose discussion? Anybody choose discussion? You did, okay. Tell us a little bit about what you, what you were thinking. Right, talking chips to check their participation. Um, did you talk at all about uh, offering them a discussion guide with specific questions or roles written down? You know, this somebody's got to have this role, somebody's got to have that role, and you change them up so that... that Excellent. Yes, offering them think time. Yeah. Um, before we actually have this discussion, figure out what it is that you want to discuss or how you're going to engage in this discussion. Yep, that's great. Thank you. You had a question or a comment? Yeah, sentence starters, sentence strips. Um, yeah, those are fabulous techniques for all students. And not everybody needs them, but they're great for English learners in particular because it gives them a base to start with. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you for offering that. Who, are you, the rest of you talked about direct instruction or lectures, did you? Yes, yes. What kinds of uh, ideas did you come up with? Very good. And so you were talking about discussions and direct instruction as part of discussions. Okay, great, thanks. The whole idea behind flipped classrooms is that they um, get the content at home and then they bring it to the classroom and they discuss it and work on it and you know, develop a, a, a case or um, a product as a result. So. Uh, that would be a way of turning, we were talking about that over here, a great way to turn a lecture into a more universally designed um, session would be to base the lecture on cases. So that you present a case and you talk about the elements that would be related to that, you know, that, that were part of the content, and then you have the students discuss it uh, you give them an opportunity to apply what you've talked about, and then you move on to another case. And they, or you can do that they choose a different case that might be more relevant to them. You provide your lecture for 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes at, at the most, and then give them a chance to apply what you've talked about using this, this case. Case-based instruction is a great way to present a lot of information in a short period of time. How about other things that we talked about over here? I know that was one of the things we talked about. And a lot of times people use the cooperative um, learning model and they don't realize that there are actually some structures to that, you know, and some rules. Uh, that it's not just sending kids out to cooperate with one another, you know, that you, uh, you do that and you, you're ahead for failure. Um, yeah, it, um, there are a variety of ways that you can build in choice and flexibility into any kind. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, I primarily lecture, that's what I like to do, so I can't use UDL. Well, yes, you can. I've been primarily lecturing 
and yet I have infused UDL strategies into this session so that um, I can maintain your attention, you can maintain your attention to this, and that you can pull out nuggets before you leave. Um, let's see what we got here. Here are some ideas around direct instruction that I kind of came up with, uh, direct instruction or lectures, making sure that you activate background knowledge at the beginning of the lesson, um, chunking the content, breaking it into segments so that the students can have a break and, and move on to another piece, clarifying vocabulary, highlighting different features using graphs and designs. You don't have this. Um, <laughs> I know I see you all furiously looking. I didn't want to give you all the answers before <laughs> we got there. Uh, so um, uh, using different kinds of graphics to describe some people. I have always felt maintained that I think in boxes. I don't think in language. I think in boxes. And if I have a graphic that helps me to understand something, I am much better able to understand it and remember it. And I think there are lots of people out there like me. Um, I'm not that unusual. So being able to put ideas, big concepts, into graphics and bullets um, is really uh, helpful for them, showing very short videos so that they can get the information in a different way from a different voice, and optimizing relevance by um, creating time within the instruction for people to have short conversations with one another, to reflect, to make a note, what it, apply it and process it as you're going through. In terms of discussion, here are some ideas around discussion. Uh, James uh, really likes discussion, but he makes sure that there's lots of options. Not everybody has to do the same thing in a discussion. Some people are very reticent to be involved in a discussion with a large group. So I think it was here where you said, well, sometimes they could just do a pairing, you know, do a two-person discussion rather than an entire group uh, and maybe not having to stand up in front of a group and, and uh, have a verbal conversation, giving them some options for that. Um, using organizers again and summaries for the discussion, giving them handouts or whatever it might be, technology where they can organize using a concept map or a semantic map of some sort so they can organize their discussion and have some kind of product at the end that they can uh, hand in or share with the rest of the group, obviously uh, offering different kinds of expression using technology. Padlet, are you familiar with Padlet? Padlet's a great way to uh, put together information uh, using free technology. There are lots and lots of different kinds of media like that available so that you can organize them and help them to organize their expressive output uh, for any kind of um, session, including discussion, and um, providing the structures for questions. Oftentimes our English learners don't know how to ask questions, but also some of our other kids don't either. And being able to give them either as sentence starters or examples, models, to give them ideas of what kinds of questions they should be asking. Uh, in, in the book I talk about a friend of mine who actually has on the wall the Bloom's technology, or Bloom's taxonomy in an upward arrow that shows from lower level questions to higher level questions. And when he's doing discussion with his, his uh, high school groups, he talks about the fact that you can only ask questions from the, <laughs> the top three on here. I don't want any what questions. You know? <laughs> the questions you're asking and you're relating to have to be from the top. Um, and doing that kind of structuring for students so that they can um, actually engage at a higher level and uh, increase their learning. Okay, here are some other examples of ways that you can use the UDL guidelines. So these are some examples of how you can uh, apply the UDL guidelines uh, to address different methods that you might be using in the classroom. I will come back to that very quickly. I see you um, trying to take notes. Let me just run through this piece and then we're gonna do something else. Um, I have a bug about lesson planning. You see that I started with goals, learner variability assessment. It took me a long time to get to methods and materials, right? That's purposeful. Oftentimes when teachers are planning their lessons, this is where they go first. 
And I, I think as a result, they miss the opportunity to really do some good planning for all the students, all the learners that they have. Uh, and they start here, I'm going to use this method, I'm going to use this cool media, you know, that I just heard about. I heard about Padlet. Patty Rallabate mentioned Padlet. I, that's my whole lesson is going to be using Padlet. Well, what's the goal? What do you, maybe Padlet doesn't work with that, <laughs> you know? So really starting here and moving to, to the methods and materials piece down in terms of the process. And then when you are adding media, don't add it just because it's cool, but add it because it actually some value. Um, and then finally, uh, FISTA to five. This is a, called the classroom assessment technique. I call them cats. You've probably seen them someplace. And some, I have a whole list of them in the book. And you can get them online too if you're ever interested in just finding quick classroom assessment technique. Look for cats. Uh, FISTA to five. Do you think now that you've heard up to this piece, do you think this is doable? Five or fifth? Five. It's doable. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. The next step is you teach the lesson, making sure you're taking data the entire time, and then you reflect. And these are some questions that you, as the classroom educator, you want to be an expert teacher as much as you want your learners to be expert learners. So applying the UDL principles to your reflection is a really good way to bump up your own skills and to bump up your understanding of UDL. So these are some of the kinds of questions you might ask in order to address each of the principles of UDL as you're reflecting on your lesson and deciding what you're going to do differently next time. Okay. That's a quick summary. It's really a roadmap as you're going along to um, develop great lessons. What I'd like you to do is to turn over your bingo sheets and think for a moment what you wish, wonder, and know now. What's one thing that you know now that you didn't know before you came in the room? What's one thing? that you um, wish uh, you knew more about? And what's one thing that you wonder about that uh, you might pursue at another date? Thank you. Thank all of you. I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards if you want to talk about anything in particular. Um, good luck with your UDL journey.